resistance. And we have to use that power of resistance and empowerment to draw attention to this fight and combine it with the coalition that we've built together and the coalitions of people that are out there that support this because people do support this. And we saw just last week as the Senate uh, Appropriations Committee was getting ready to pass judgment on the D.C. Appropriations Bill, we combined all the work that we've been doing out in the streets. People getting arrested, people like Anise and others. Combined with our coalition partners getting really busy and active in states like Illinois and Louisiana and Alaska and Arkansas. And so senators received thousands, literally thousands of calls last week. Most Washingtonians don't even know this. At the same time that they saw hundreds of people out on the street. Where? Right outside the Dirksen building. Including with the mayor and others getting arrested. We have to employ the tactics of empowerment in order for us to draw the attention of the American people and advance our goals. And let me say that the things that we've been doing so far uh, are not enough. They are not enough. These are important, but they're like shots in the dark, right? Because the, the tactic of empowerment and the resistance movements and civil disobedience really is not a photo opportunity. They're not uh, opportunities where we get uh, in front of a camera in front of the Dirksen building and sit on the uh, uh, ground with the mayor and get arrested. Those are important and they're critical and we've done them. But we have to take civil disobedience to the next level. Because civil disobedience worked in the civil rights movement and in India and elsewhere when those movements created the need for a resolution when they either took a situation and turned it into a crisis or exposed the crisis that exists. And that's the problem in DC. We have a crisis every day. Who sees it? There's nobody sitting on the back of the bus, forcefully, right? There are no signs that say DC residents can't drink from this water fountain. So this crisis has to be, this crisis has to be exposed, and it can be exposed through, uh, uh, through a movement of empowerment that goes to the next level, which brings me through the to the third point, strategy. Before we can free DC, we have to free DC's budget. The fights are today. The fight for statehood is right now. On these earmarks to the appropriations bill and everything else we're doing. And so we have to take these opportunities because, you know, uh, uh, some of our opponents are giving us gifts. After years of letting the district budget go into effect on October 1st, Right now, uh, Republicans in the Congress are saying no. And guess what? In some ways, they're handing us a gift. Because we're going to be able to say to the American people, when we go after budget uh, 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 autonomy, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment, this is why. You see what these folks are doing. So we have to use this moment now to ask for more, to demand more, and to get more. And that means that the D.C. government, the largest organization in this movement, has to get much more aggressive. So we've seen the personal leadership of the mayor and others, right? But we need to see institutional leadership. Institutional leadership. And we saw it early on uh, in this century with the slogan on the D.C. tax, uh, on the D.C. license plate, right? Taxation by representation. Powerful slogan. Angers a lot of our opponents up on the hill, right? hate seeing that slogan. And some people have confessed that you know they want to give us something so that they can just get rid of the slogan. That's how much they hate. But we need more things like that. Where's that street sign between the Capitol building and the, uh, and the White House that we talked about last year? The council needs to get moving on that. And we can not only ask for budget control, but we can also, I believe, take it. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be meeting with our allies and with, with uh, stakeholders to figure out how do we use the institutional power that the D.C. government has and the District of Columbia and the people have to advance our common goals and our common purposes. We must do this. We must do this because by doing so, we will elevate this fight to where it needs to be. And I was struck this morning, most of you don't know, that uh, Bart Turner, a lone 
protester who was inspired by what happened on April 11th when 41 people got arrested, most of them spontaneously. People just showed up at a rally because they were very upset that our friend, President Barack Obama, delivered the District of Columbia to our nemesis, John Boehner. People were upset and they got arrested. And Bart Turner was inspired. He said, you know what, I'm gonna get arrested too. And so he went up to Capitol Hill, got a little sign, and stepped over a rope line and was arrested. And today, it was supposed to be his trial. But he, guess what, he demanded a jury trial. And the government wasn't interested in that. Giving him a platform with, uh, before a group of, what, DC residents <laughs> on a jury? Who knows how that trial was gonna end? Raise your hand if you know how that trial was gonna end, right? So they decided not to give him a jury trial. But guess what? Bart found his voice. His wife came up to me afterwards. She said, you know, he's been suffering from anxiety his whole life. But I've never seen him like this. He's not anxious. Look how much he's talking. And she was beating him. And Bart wasn't anxious because he found his voice. He found his soul. And that's what all of us need to do. Collectively find our voice. We can get to statehood. If we stick with the message, if we use the tactics, of empowerment, and we strategize so that we demand and we take the rights that we can get now and keep fighting the good fight. So thank you all.